Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with, well, sort of the history on disc of the Philips series of Haydn's operas. Now, where do we begin? I begin with something I can't show you because it's in the old overflow room. But you all mentioned it, or at least those of you who were there at the time I was making videos from the old overflow room, where behind me was a long line of yellow boxes. And some of you tried to guess what they were. And lots of you asked what they were. And yes, it was the complete Haydn opera series on Phillips, which is not the complete Haydn operas. There are more of them, but it was all the ones that they did. Um, and and it was a wonderful series. It featured Antal Dorati and an amazing cast of singers, and we're going to go through them. But I just wanted to say, I mean, I kept those because they have the librettos, you know, which you kind of like need when you're dealing with operas and vocal music generally. So yeah, I have them all. They're all sitting there in the overflow room. The reason they're in the overflow room is because when I needed to, you know, economize on space when I was in my apartment in Brooklyn, particularly, I was able to get these. The other Haydn, these are all the same ones, squished into two boxes. Now, actually, I have two of these, of each of these somewhere around here. But um, yeah, I mean, here they are. There, there are four operas in each box, and you can't read the lettering because it's they do it in a way that, see how like hard that is to read? But there are four in each box. You get L'Incontro Improviso, L'Infidelta de Luza, L'Isola Disabitata, Il Mondo della Luna, Armida, La Fedeltà Premiata, Orlando Palladino, and La Vera Costanza. Hey, I did it, sort of. Huh? Pretty cool. So they were this, these two box things here, which I'm going to stuff back into the shelf here where whence they came, and I had them so that if I needed them for some reason, um, I mean, I listen to them, but I know what the stories are now, so I just play them and enjoy them and that kind of stuff. But the, yeah, so that was that. But then you may recall Phillips, which was now, which is now Decca, but which was then Phillips, I think it was still Phillips at the time, released a bunch of operas in boxes. They All the Prokofiev operas they did with Gurdjieff, all the Rimsky-Korsakov operas, all the Janicek operas that they had in their catalog. They stuffed them all in a box. And Universal was doing it generally. There was the Abbato Verdi box and the Abbato Rossini box and, you know, all of that kind of stuff, right? They did these budget opera boxes or mid-price, whatever they were. So there were all these opera boxes. And one of them was the Haydn opera box, which is exactly the same as those two boxes. So as we see, the Haydn operas have gone from, from this to this, now to this. Yeah, all in a box. It's all the same stuff. They keep doing it. And what makes this whole circumstance so bizarre, I mean, so absolutely insane, is that they spent a lot of money on these things. I mean, they really did. Wait till you hear the casting. It's fabulous. Yeah. But they spent a lot of money doing it. And and they delete it, and then they reissue it, then they delete it again, then they re-reissue it, and each time they have to redesign the packaging, and it gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper because they want to spend less and less and less and less money. I get it. But all of this stuff was just tossed out there with nary a word to the wise. They don't promote or sell it. It just pops up. And... You know, I mean, even if the cheapy reissue like this, I mean, some thought had to go into it. I mean, you know, someone had to design it and they had to make it and they had to stuff it. And they had to distribute it. Unbelievable. Just unbelievable. So what do we get? Let's see what they are, what these eight operas are. What the major one that's missing is L'Anima del Filosofo or Orfeo e Euridice. That's the opera he wrote for, Italy, uh, for England when he was in England that was never performed. And it's really gorgeous. It's a fabulous opera with a genuinely tragic, scary ending. I mean, it's really unique for its time, and it, it works wonderfully in concert because, you know, there's no opportunity to stage things like that, heaven forbid. Anyway, what do we got? So you have Armida. 
Armida, we all know the story of Armida. Everyone did in Armida. You know, she's the sorceress and she, you know, rides away at her chariot drawn by dragons and foaming and screaming and whatnot. So Armida is Jesse Norman, Clace Ancio, uh, Norma Burroughs, Sam Raimi, Anthony Rolf Johnson, and Robert Legate, or Leggett, or whatever Robin's name is. So there you go. I mean, it's, and it's with Antal Dorati, and most of these are with the Lausanne Chamber Orchestra. Uh, it's... A phenomenal cast. It's marvelous. There have been recordings of Armida since then. Cecilia Bartoli did it. So yeah, it's 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 a serious role. And and you know, people complain about these because Dorati did take the recitatives rather slowly. He did. He also cut them nicely in some of these operas, otherwise they'd have been terribly long. But yeah, it's okay. I mean, you know, the, the singing is wonderful. The musical parts are amazing and you can always skip over the recitatives and that's fine. Then we have La Fedeltà Premiata with Lucia Valentini Terrani. Um, let's see, Tony Landi, Frederica von Stad, von Stade, Frederica von Stade, Alan Titus, Ileana Kotrubash, Luigi Alva. I mean, what a cast. And it's a terrific opera. You know, it's, 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 um, one of those, you know, crusader things. It's, it begins with La Chasse, the finale of that symphony number, what, 73 is The Hunt, La Chasse. It's the same piece, and it's just delicious. The trouble with, with, with Haydn's comic operas um, was that they usually have two big acts and then a really tiny little third act that just resolves it all. Because, you know, they weren't performed alone in those days. They were performed with ballets and other stuff and interpolations. I mean, there was a reason for it that was good in the day. It's not so good now. So the best way to do it is to just play the whole thing straight through. But those third acts, they don't have big finales. You know, they, they can be a sort of an anticlimax, even though they resolve the story. That's the point. And, you know, we just have to get used to the, you know, it's all a question of psychology, right? We, we, we poo-poo them and talk about how terrible they are. And, but that is only true until they're staged really well and imaginatively, because the music is magnificent. There's tons and tons of great music in these operas. It's just, it's just fantastic. But it may be that stage-worthy-wise, until we get a stage-worthy staging that's worthy, um, they, they aren't going to do so well. It's just the way life works. I mean, it was the same thing with the Bach cantatas. Everyone said, oh, the Bach chorale cantatas. What a letdown. You've got all this great stuff. Then everyone sings the chorale at the end. It's so disappointing. Well, nobody says that now. It's just as true as it was back then when everyone thought they were disappointing. But we just don't believe it. We've changed our aesthetic criteria. Well, that can happen just as easily with Haydn's operas because there's nothing inherent, uh, inherently defective about them. So then we get... Orlando Palladino. Well, this is a comic retelling of the Orlando story, which everyone did operas about. It's really quite funny. I mean, it's delightful. This has Arlene Alger, Ellie Ameling, Gwendolyn Killebrew, George Shirley, Clays Ancho, Benjamin Luxon, Domenico Trimarchi, who did all those wonderful Rossini operas. He's a buffo baritono. Incredible cast. And then La Vera Costanza with Jesse Norman, Helen Donat, Clays Ancho, Kari Lovas, um, Vladimiro Gonzaroli, Domenico Trimarchi, and Anthony Rolf Johnson. Well, Vera Costanza is a really long opera if you do all of it. This one squishes it down to two discs. Then we have L'Incontro Improviso with Linda Zogby, Clace Ancho, Margaret Marshall, Della Jones, Domenico Trimarchi, and Benjamin Luxon. These are fabulous casts. They really are. And L'Incontro Improviso is a lot of fun because it's the same plot as Mozart's The Abduction from the Seraglio and Gluck also did that opera, although in French. So you can get the same story a million different ways by like all the major opera composers of the day. It's fun to compare them. It really is. And it's got like the Turkish percussion and all that stuff. You know, it's, it's, it's delightful. Then we have L'Infidelta de Lusa. This is a delicious small scale opera. I mean, the orchestra is tiny, but the plot is, it's compact by Haydn opera standards. It is only in two acts, I think. It doesn't have like that third act appendix at the end. And it's with Edith Mathis, Barbara Hendricks, Clays Ancio, Aldo Baldan, Michael Devlin, Michel Devlin, whatever his name is, no, Michael Devlin, whatever his name is, who cares? Wonderful, wonderful opera, very stageable. Robbins Landon was really pushing this one because he'd actually um, been involved in stagings of it that worked extremely well. He did it at the Holland Festival, I think, in like 1960-something, who knows. It was the first Haydn opera ever revived. And last, oh, not last, second to last, L'Isola Disabitata. This is a masterpiece. 
This is a chamber opera in glucky in form. In other words, it's completely through composed. It has no dry or secco recitativo with the harpsichordio. No, they sing the whole thing. And it's about 90 minutes long. It's like as long as Mahler's Third Symphony. It's really, really wonderful. It only has four characters. Um, you know, they're on a deserted island and, 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 and the, the, you know, one of them is, is she, she thinks she's been abandoned and she hates men and, and her daughter was born on the island and she's never seen one before. Then the two guys arrive, you know, with her old boyfriend to rescue, you know, the woman who thinks she's been abandoned, but she really hasn't been. But there was like a shipwreck and there were pirates and it was a whole thing. And so the whole thing is just about how they reconnect. And it's just delightful. It's wonderful. Haydn was very proud of it. Haydn knew it was a great opera. He called it an operetta because it was short, but it's, it's delightful. It's marvelous. And then Il Mondo della Luna, The World on the Moon. I mean, it's a comedy. It's funny. It's delightful. It's, you know, you know the story. It's the, whatever the old guy who wakes up and he thinks he's on the moon and he meets all the crazy moon characters. And, you know, it's just, it's just light entertainment at its best. And it's with Arlene Auger, Edith Mathis, Frederica von Stade, Lucia Valentini, Tirani, Luigi Alva, Anthony Rolf Johnson, and Domenico Tremarchi. Wow! Wow, with casts like that, right? And 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 here's Philip sitting on this stuff and and just tossing it out, doing whatever they want. Go figure. Blows my mind. But the Haydn operas are worth exploring. They're worth exploring if only for the fabulous singing of the, the cast members who they got to do these productions. I mean, they spent so much money on these. And it's just not right that they should be neglected by the label that spent the money. I mean, never mind the rest of the world. It's unbelievable. But I wanted to talk about them just to let you know that they exist. Some of you have suggested this for the greatest recording projects ever. And if it were like complete in some way, maybe it would be. But, but you know, these are not operas of the quality of Mozart's operas. Where, you know, we don't have to play the game of comparisons in that sense. You, you have to enjoy them and take them for what they are. Rossini once spent some time going through them and said they were all terrible. Uh, you know, it, it, it all depends on, 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 as operas, remember, as theater. And Haydn himself didn't like writing opera. I mean, he did a good job for these. He did them for his patron, and he was suitably rewarded for them. But he spent most of his career in Esterhaza as an operatic producer, as an impresario, putting on operas by other people and writing some of his own. But afterwards, when he didn't have to do operas and they asked him to write an opera, he said, don't ask me to ask Mozart. I could, he saw The Marriage of Figaro is what happened, and he gave up completely operas because he realized that this was a whole, whole different sort of, whole different standard of what opera could be. And, and after Mozart, he just said, nobody compares with Mozart. I can't compare with Mozart. I don't want to compare with Mozart. Go for Mozart. But because he was so self-deprecating about it, we take that to mean, well, these must suck. Well, that's not true. That's not true. He did his best. They're lovely works for what they are. A couple of them are out and out masterpieces and they deserve to be heard. So, this was the box. Of course, this is out of print, too. By the way, <laughs> you can't find this either. Uh, you know, it's the life in the world of classical music record collecting is just a never-ending source of agony and ecstasy in equal measure, isn't it? So keep on listening, friends. Take care.